I want to thank all of you who are joining us on this um, beautiful Thursday afternoon in Northeastern Ohio. The sun is out and the sky is blue, uh, which is great uh, for this holiday weekend. And I should just say, you know, happy holidays to all the celebrants of whether it's Easter or Passover or in the middle of Ramadan. Um, I think at a event I was at last night, we also acknowledge uh, the guardians and uh, cavaliers, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, so happy celebrations to, to all celebrants. Uh, my name is Jeremy Johnson. I'm the president and CEO of Assembly for the Arts. And I want to thank you for joining us. If you are here for the April Workbench session on Fiscal Sponsorship 101, you are in the right area. We're going to be talking about that today. And before we begin, we always like to acknowledge that our discussions and where we are doing our work with you is on the sacred land of native people. So from wherever you and I are calling in today, we acknowledge that this land all around us remains connected to the native tribes and their ancestors and we hold space to acknowledge them. So let us pause to do that for a moment. Thank you. People of all abilities are encouraged to participate in these sessions. Live transcription is available for today's discussion and instructions on how to enable the captioning, they're right here in this slide and in the chat box. A couple quick introductions. If we have any board members of Assembly for the Arts, I want to acknowledge them as well. Uh, there are 27 uh, members of the Arts uh, Assembly for the Arts Board, and they all play a major role and a major part in how we do our work to be a unifying voice for arts and culture, to lift up and to expand the pie of resources, and to increase the equity within our sector. So we acknowledge our board of trustees who may be here. I also want to say special thanks to the people that are making today happen, and that is the wonderful staff of Assembly, including Valerie Schumacher, Meg Matko, and Leandra Richardson, as well as Kristen Putch. Uh, the question up, someone's posted, will notes and slides be available afterwards? Yes, this, this video is being recorded for you to come back and to review, as well as uh, the materials that will be shared. Absolutely. And um, I also want to acknowledge our partner, our, our sister organization in all things arts and culture is uh, our area's major funder organization funded by taxpayer dollars in Cuyahoga County. You all know them as I do. They are Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Uh, and so we thank our teammates from CAC for being here. And at this point, I want to turn the meeting over to the one and only Meg Matko, who's gonna walk us through everything we need to know about fiscal sponsorship. So take it over, Meg, and thank you all for being here. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Meg and welcome. Um, I just wanna provide some quick context on the Workbench series and where it came from. So in learning from uh, Cleveland's arts and culture communities throughout the previous year, our team has really seen the need for practical support and connections rise to the top as a priority for creative workers. And those are things like financial sustainability, health insurance, accessibility, um, equity practices, things like legal assistance. Uh, so we developed the workbench sessions. Workbench sessions are a series of free workshops and trainings Assembly is offering throughout 2022, focused on connecting creative workers to practical resources, valuable networks, and special opportunities. Uh, we're working with experts and partners and internally um, to help us teach, connect, and provide for all parts of the creative community. And that means individual artists, nonprofit organizations and creative businesses, the famous three-legged stool. Um, so today's session is all about fiscal sponsorship. What is fiscal sponsorship? Does a fiscal sponsor give me money? How can this benefit me as a creative? 
um, we get a lot of questions about fiscal sponsorship and what it is. So we wanna provide that information. Valerie Schumacher, Assembly for the Arts Dir Director of Strategic Initiatives and the lead on our fiscal sponsorship program is here. And she's gonna provide us with some answers to these basic questions. We have also a couple of our current fiscal sponsees um, on the call with us today. So we'll get a chance to hear from them and we'll have some time for Q&A as well. So I just threw a lot of information at you, but you'll have some, a minute to digest that as I welcome Valerie Schumacher. Hello, and I'm sharing my screen. I just need a moment while I set that up. So I wanted to get us started today just to see how everybody is today. Um, just to ask the question, I know the worst thing is having to talk. So I'll leave it to popcorn. You can volunteer. Um, and just I'm inviting you to unmute yourself. There's no order to this, but just, you know, how are you currently funding your work? Are you an artist? Are you a nonprofit? Are you a starting a small business? Are you already an existing small business? And how are you currently funding your work in general? Oh, I'm getting loans. I have gotten loans and I've been consulting and just, you know, sustaining myself by producing work and opportunities to kind of sustain the art that I produce through videography, photography, and consultation. And you charge, so it's earned income then, right? So you charge a fee for those things? Yeah, and yeah. I've gotten loans. Yeah. Yep. I can go. I'm an individual artist. I um, fund my art making through um, cobbling together teaching, um, public projects and commissions. Um, and I'm also interested in expanding my practice into a small business. That's why I'm here. I'm kind of curious to learn if fiscal sponsorship might be a good fit for that endeavor. Um, and then I also uh, have applied rather unsuccessfully for a lot of grants <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thanks. I'll share. Um, I work for a nonprofit and we, um, most of our funding comes from grants um, and sponsorships from um, different businesses or organizations. Um, we do have some work that's paid for by clients. Um, they pay to host a performance um, and fundraisers. Oh, also individual donors as well. And you're a nonprofit then, or are you in the process of becoming one? You are. Um, no, I, I work for a nonprofit. Okay, um, so gotcha. Yeah. I knew that. I just wanted everybody to know. <laughs> Um, I will share, um, I have been getting funded by grants, which rarely happens, also by clients that get grants for me to share the work I do, which is basically education on elementary and high schools, mostly public. And that's the cultural uh, work that I do with the Afro-Brazilian culture, and music-wise, it's just by clients funded. And I'm not um, 501c3, I, I'm on the fence. If I become one, I'm not, and yeah. wondering about it and studying a lot as much as I can. I think we have time for about one or two more, and then I'll, and then I'll keep us moving. Who wants to go next? There's a couple in the chat too. Oh, um, we've got nonprofits funding themselves through grants, donations, earned revenue. As we come out of COVID, that's from Celeste. Um, and Heather Meeker says we're a nonprofit and receive a combination of grants, donations, earned revenue from resident artists, tenants looking to improve and move into um, their own fiscal sponsorship services for Summit County. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, those are all really, um, it's exciting to have a number of grant, of grant 
uh, seekers here as well as individual artists. So I'm excited for the conversation ahead. Um, so the, the question for many of, many of us um, here is, should you pursue fiscal sponsorship? Before we even get started, um, do you have donors who want to deduct from their taxes? So individual donors who want to who are asking, you know, I'd like to I'd like to claim any donations I make on my taxes. You can only do that if you have a C three status. Are you seeking foundation grants? Often, same goes with foundations. They can only give to nonprofits five hundred one C threes. Do you have a specific project in mind that's time delimited? And really importantly, that project is for the greater good, which I can get into a little bit more, but essentially the difference between a nonprofit or fiscal sponsorship relationship is that the intent is not to make yourself money in the end. It is designed to deliver a greater purpose to the community and to the residents or to the world in general. Um, and that could be many, many, many things. Um, but that's ultimately the, the the underscoring of all of these items. Um, or are you thinking about starting a nonprofit and you're just not sure if you want to go all the way? Maybe a fiscal sponsorship is a way to incubate your idea. Why Assembly offers fiscal sponsorship? A number of reasons. So in January, um, we talked with the grant makers in the arts, and one of their key findings in a lot of the research that they did are that arts-based projects are uniquely undercapitalized, even in comparison to other nonprofit fields. The arts often are either budgeting to zero or budgeting on, at a deficit, rather than securing funds for the future, rainy day funds, things like that. We also learned that in particular, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color leading arts projects are often working across sectors or across business models, and they may not neatly fit within funder giving profiles or within the nonprofit profile. And so it's a nice way to help artists kind of navigate the funding world when you don't neatly fit within a certain category. From the artistic's perspective, statistically, we know that artists often are balancing work. We heard this um, with a day job or doing a lot of projects at once to establish a, a living wage. So this is a way to maybe get a, get a little bit of a ground, um, a little bit of support on even one of those projects. Um, and we also know that the creative process just changes a lot over time. It changes how you think, it changes what you're interested, not what you're interested in, but, um, but it just, it, it's, a, it's an evolving process. So you may wanna pursue a project, but you're not ready to commit to a full nonprofit. You really would like to see the project through and, and leave it at that. So there's just, you know, there's a lot of um, leeway with fiscal sponsorship, a little bit more flexibility. A little bit more on assembly before we get into the meat of the fiscal sponsorship. Um, so assembly for the arts is a 501c3. And that's why we're able to offer fiscal sponsorship. We are a in very close partnership, as Jeremy said, with Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. They are a public agency. And then Assembly for Action is an advocacy wing that allows us to lobby for specific issue at campaigns. I should say it, it provides more flexibility. Every nonprofit is able to lobby to a certain extent, but a C4 has a lot more flexibility in what it's able to do and fundraise for. Um, Jeremy Johnson is the president and CEO of both Assembly for the Arts and Assembly for Action. If you start hearing about Assembly for Action, it is connected. Um, Jill Paulson is the director of Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. You may have seen their board meeting yesterday. She's a great, does great work. And then both of us have staffs that work uniquely together. And then assemblies, we work together to get input and feedback from the arts and cultural community to make sure that what that we are serving the arts and cultural sector and that you're able to provide input at a regular basis to your service organizations. So as we get into the fiscal sponsorship, we just saw just, you know, straight definition, fiscal sponsorship is a contractual relationship to allow a person, a group or business to advance a charitable or other exempt activities with the benefit of tax exempt status of a sponsor organization. So that's a lot of words. So I'm gonna get into a little bit what, what fiscal sponsorship is and what it isn't. The biggest question and the biggest confusion that people have, fiscal sponsorship, it's a way to access grant funds without becoming your own, nine, your own 501c3. It is not direct funding. 
if you have a fiscal sponsorship, that does not mean that you may even get any money at all. It's strictly a pass through, a way to access funds that you otherwise would not have even a, uh, a door, a foot in the door. It is part of an overall revenue strategy. It's not the only way to get a project funded. So as you all know, you, you finding fun in other ways. This is just one more tool to add to the to toolbox on your workbench. Throw in a little, throw a little branding in there. Um, it is a legal way to provide resources to public causes. It's not a loophole for businesses to get grants. There is some um, Precedent physical sponsorship is a long running way for projects to get funded for funders to be able to fund projects that they're interested in funding um, and making sure that all of the channels are properly um, gone through essentially. It is a relationship and it's not a hierarchy. It's not about one person being more important than another. And you have to remember that the project is not possible without you. You are the project. The, the same is true with the taxes exempt status that when a nonprofit takes on a fiscal sponsored project, they also accept all the risks related to those grant funds. So there is a lot of give and take and communication between those two relationships is really important. Excuse me. There's two kinds of fiscal sponsorships. Um, so a comprehensive fiscal sponsorship is where the project falls directly under the nonprofit. Um, everything you do is, is fits within that 501c3. So the sponsor retains a lot more control and ownership over the project, um, but the project also gets a lot of services. They get a lot more um, direct uh, support from that nonprofit on things like administration. A pre-approved model essentially is that you apply for a grant and that organization has already approved that those funds will go directly to you. So the sponsor essentially lets you borrow the C3 status, but they're only responsible for the charitable funds that go through them. And the project then maintains a separate legal entity and all that independence and ownership over its work. So it's a little bit of a more distant relationship. There is still a lot that goes in hand in hand between those two organizations. It's just a little bit of a different, and it's all it's all outlined in the contract. So if you are a nonprofit wants to provide fiscal sponsorship or an artist who is interested in pursuing fiscal sponsorship, every contract is different and you'll wanna be very clear about as you read through which kind. Assembly is more in the lines of the pre-approved process, just, just to be clear. So assembly, we do have some things that we offer as part of the fiscal sponsorship program, but ultimately the work is yours and we'll get more into that in a moment. And a pre-approved um, model you have, so this is essentially how that relationships works that I talked about. So you have the funding, um, that funding goes directly to the C3. That C3 then typically takes a fee and delivers it right back to that project. That project communicates with the sponsor on all fronts. They are usually writing the grants. They're usually doing all of the reporting. They're reporting their expenses, providing receipts. It's a lot of back and forth. And they're also maintaining these relationships with the funders, because even though the money is going to the nonprofit and that relationship is important, those funding sources are typically funding that project. And oftentimes a project is funded because of they are, trust the management and the ability of the person running to make sure that that project will actually go through and be uh, have the impact that it says it will. That's an investment thing, but it, it kind of rings true with funding too. Um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of a really brief overview of what fiscal sponsorship, you can get a lot into the nitty gritty more. So I just wanted to provide a few resources to get more information about fiscal sponsorship. You've got Candid. They used to be the Foundation Center and GuideStar, and then they merged together. So all the resources that you used to get from Foundation Center or Grantmaker, or uh, sorry, one of their websites is now at Candid or Candid Learning. Um, you can also look up nonprofit statuses. If you're, if you're wondering if there is an organization that has a C3 status, you can go to Candid and look up their name and find out if they have, if they're a registered nonprofit. 
Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, as you're looking through contracts, is a great resource. Um, you have to contact them and give them some leeway time because they are a committee of volunteer lawyers, obviously, um, and they meet every month to review applications, but they're an excellent resource for any legal needs, um, including contract review. Um, the National Network of Fiscal Sponsors is a great resource. They have a ton of information. And what I am going to put, uh, pull up here is that they have 10 questions every project should ask before joining fiscal sponsorship. So I am going to take liberty and answer these questions for you as from Assembly's point of view. Before we do that, any questions about sort of what fiscal sponsorship is in general? I do. Yes. I, I was wondering what could be the difference in between a C3 and a C4? So a C3 is a type of nonprofit that is dedicated to the education or, or services to the public. They cannot, there are restrictions around their ability to lobby to support a political candidate. Can't do that or not. You can't do, you can't do anything that is partisan. You cannot support a political candidate. You can do some lo lobbying on an issue level. So for example, a schools, a, a private school who's a nonprofit C3 can support a, a, an issue for education, but they can't support the, the, a runner for mayor. Um, a C4 can do that. They don't typically do a lot of the services that C3s do. They're typically focused on that. Um, on that, you know, that piece that allows them to lobby directly with public officials. Cozy is a great example of a C4. They are, um, they're a, what's the word? They're a group of people, they advocate, I can't remember what it's called, but um, they do a lot of lobbying and they provide that um, connection and they lobby with, uh, or they help provide health insurance to people and do those bulk purchasing options and things. Um, so question one, when you're looking for sponsorship, how soon can my project be sponsored? Oftentimes we hear an artist has an opportunity to get, get a grant, but they need a fiscal sponsor and the deadline is tomorrow. Um, that we can usually accommodate, but it's not ideal. Um, it typically takes about a month. Once we have an understanding of who you are, what your project is, um, we have an intake process that you know you fill out some information provide a project description and a budget um it's that's done by staff so it's pretty straightforward um so basically it's best to start early before you have to actually start fundraising fundraising or meeting your deadlines it's best to get a little bit of a head start but we can typically accommodate if it's something that you know you've been invited to apply for what's our piece of the pineapple um, we, Assembly, charges 6% of anything that is earned through a grant. If you don't earn anything, Assembly does not get anything. If, um, I would say the standard, based on what everything that we've read and heard, is that um, it's anywhere between 5% and 10% of an administrative fee. If it's, uh, for example, the, um, the national group that funds, or, or that sponsors artists, um, Fractured Atlas, they're about 10%. There's other smaller nonprofits that are closer to 3%. So it varies based on how much they're willing to accept as far as donations, what kind of services they provide, how many people they provide sponsorship to and things like that. So basically, um, if often, I think our average is about $5,000 grant, assembly would keep $300 of that $5,000 grant. So you would have 4,700 in actuality for the project. Numbers, I know, sorry, just threw that out there in case for those of us who like our, like our calculations. Um, are you okay with us applying for our own C3 in the next six months? Absolutely. Um, we're here to help where we can. We love to support. We're all about expanding arts and cultural sector. Um, we know a lot about the nonprofit landscape. Uh, we know that CAC does not accept fiscal sponsorship and you may be interested in, in applying for some of those funds. There's lots of reasons to apply. There's also a lot of things that you need to consider as you go into a C3 status. There's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of um, uh, requirements by the state that you need to fulfill. So absolutely. 
how much control will our project have um, over the way our money is spent? We are totally open. As long as it's permitted with not within the nonprofit restrictions, you have full control over how you operate your project. We just ask that you send us copies of all the receipts and invoices so that we can track those finances and that they adhere to the grant agreement that you've signed with or that we've signed with the funder. And that you complete the project that you say you're gonna complete. That's a small detail. Um, if we get funding up front, but don't spend it down right away, what happens to the interest? The fiscal sponsor has discretion over all interest funds. So those go to assembly in our case. I don't know how others handle that, um, but typically because the funds are coming into the assembly bank accounts, those the interest just maintains there. What services do you provide in addition to accepting grant funds? Excuse me. So we try to provide counsel to all of our all of our but regardless of how much how big your grants are going, if you receive any grants, we do try to provide as much counsel as we can. That's it. We're in the business of helping. Um, we do offer some record keeping. Um, we provide all charitable receipts. Uh, we monitor the income and contributions that come in through online. Um, I'm going to read through my notes here because I don't want to forget anything. Um, we check daily to just keep an eye on what's coming in. We do report all the income on the IRS Form 990. Um, there are some tax implications to fiscal sponsorship, so it's best to really consult a tax preparer when you're dealing with fiscal sponsorship through your business because there's a lot of confusing um, uh, sort of balancing acts that go on because the business is still responsible for filing its own taxes because of the way we have the model. Like I said, we're borrowing the nonprofit status, but there's still tax implications for the for the business. Um, we do offer an online portal to receive online donations on behalf of those spots. See, those are subject to the 6% fee. Um, and then we just keep a accounting data stored in on the cloud. So we make sure that you have safe records and they're kept securely. Um, how do I pay myself for my time? 100% you should be paid for your time and it should be included in part of your budget to your grantee. Those things, there's a lot of different um, ways you can calculate how you pay for yourself, what artist fees are. We do recommend wage as a standard for how to pay artists and including how to pay yourself. That's typically for things like um, uh, exhibitions and things. It doesn't really cover, if you want, if you're more interested in um, like administrative costs, there's other resources there that we could help provide, but it should absolutely be calculated and as part of your budget. And you should really value your time that you spent on your project. I'm going to take a quick break because I'm starting to lose my voice. Is there any questions on what I've said so far? Okay, give me one second while I have a sip of my of my juice. I'm sorry, I'm used to working from home so much. I don't talk this much. <sighs> um, all right, so if you work with volunteers and interns, how do you handle that? Typically, again, as I said, you're, um, you can handle all of your own project management, including volunteers. The biggest piece here is that we ask as part of the contract to make sure that assembly is covered under your liability insurance, which is a good habit if you are doing any kind of public events. Um, I'll just leave it there. What role does your board of directors play as compared to our advisory board? So if you do have an advisory board, some people don't. Um, in fact, most artists, I wouldn't imagine, don't have an advisory board. But if you're considering a nonprofit model, you may have an advisory board that still manages all of your own affairs. So your advisory board still provides all its advice on how you manage on the relationship. They'll, they're going to want um, some input as to whether or not you even enter into the fiscal sponsorship agreement in the first place. Um, the assembly board of directors is um, does not have a lot of control or does not really micromanage any of the work of the fiscal sponsors. They're, they're accepting a fiduciary responsibility over what assembly's nonprofit status is. And so they approved the fiscal, they, they've approved the program that has been designed. Um, they govern assembly overall and including the agreement, but the staff really conducts all of the relationship building with you all. 
and there's an approved set of criteria, um, which I can pull up in a moment. Um, so it's really separated. So our board is really high level. They're not going to get into the nitty gritty of your project often unless there's some kind of like major catastrophe regarding the funding source or something like that. Um, all nonprofits are required to have a governing board. So it is, if you are if you are developing a nonprofit, you will have to develop a board. That board can be made up of people that you know and that are directly impacted by the work or by the product, but they is required to have one as well as an article of incorporation, uh, et cetera. Um, you, we, so this is really important for the arts field in particular. So these questions were not um, designed by the art for specifically arts nonprofits and arts fiscal sponsorship, but we are feel very strongly that your pro intellectual property is your own. You own all intellectual property, both during and after fiscal sponsorship relationship ends. We may occasionally ask to license images, you know, both to promote you and to promote assembly. I know there's a big concern about assembly trying to take ownership and, and take credit for other things. I know that's credit is a really big important thing, especially in the arts, because so much relies on your on your word and on your on your product, on your craft. Um, so we feel very strongly that you own all of your all of your creative property. And we do ask if we do want to use something that you have, we do make sure that we ask and we make sure that you know what, what, what our intention is. Um, Uh, will my project have a separate bank account? As far as assembly is concerned, we keep all the donations in a main, there's, we have a bank account or two that have all of the funds in them. So we account for that through bookkeeping and QuickBooks. So every project has its own restricted funds on the books, but it doesn't show itself in a separate bank account. The bank account is what it is. It's a pool money, but, um, but the uh, but the accounting is where it's separated and where um, where the fees are taken out, et cetera. If you are creating your own separate bank account, we, which we absolutely think it's important to separate your project funds and your business funds from your personal funds because it gets real sticky, especially when you're talking about tax time and you're getting audited. It's a lot easier when everything's separated out, especially as well when you're if anything if you become liable for anything and talking a lot about liability just because it's such a big issue and because i come from a family of lawyers and that's what lawyers are all concerned with so liability um if you have things separated out if you have all of your ducks in a row it's a lot easier um to be protected in um in case something happened or something came up um where can you go for funding? And by the way, there were 11 questions. That 11th, but I don't know. They said 10 questions on that or 11th. So just, I know how to count. I just, that's what they had. I don't know if it was a bonus. Um, whose door can you knock on in Cleveland? Funders we know for sure, except fiscal sponsorship are Cleveland Foundation, Gund Foundation, and Fowler Foundation, because those are, oh, and St. Luke's Foundation. Um, because those are who have funded assembly through fiscal sponsorship. There's also a foundation, Akron Community Foundation also accepts fiscal sponsorship. Um, Ohio Arts Council does accept fiscal sponsorship, but only if you intend to become a nonprofit. They don't fund artists through fiscal sponsorship or a business that's doing a charitable project. Uh, CAC, or NEA, both government entities, um, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture or the National Endowment for Arts, they do not accept fiscal sponsorship. Um, if you have a question, typically you can ask a project, if they don't have it online, oftentimes if they have a, if you see an application deadline, it'll say fiscal sponsorship is not accepted. Or if you need a fiscal sponsor, we can help you find one. Um, if they don't have things like that, then you can always ask a project or a, a project coordinator or um, one of a contact at the foundation, and they'll typically be very accommodating. The best thing to do is create relationships with the people who you're trying to get funding from. Um, any C3 nonprofit really who else provides fiscal sponsorship? Any, any C3 nonprofit can technically be a fiscal sponsor. We know a lot of... Um, community development corporations who provide fiscal sponsorship and neighborhood organizations. 
um, and groups in other human service fields. The one um, unique thing is that it has to be related to that nonprofit's mission. So if you're, you're running, in our case, we are very clear that we accept uh, artists, that art and cultural projects that, ex that span across sectors. And we're not geographically, we're not set in our geography as long as it's Northeast Ohio. So we're not tied to, you know, Buckeye community development or something like that. Um, we do, what was the other thing I wanted to say about that? Different nonprofits, you would want to ask all of these questions and um, some nonprofits just prefer to stay away from it because they don't want to deal with the liability. Um, and that's up to the board of that nonprofit at that time. So it's always about just a lot of conversations with um, staff and with board members and finding the right fit for you and the right program for you. Um, that both fits your budget, fits your mission, and um, fits your personality, honestly. So just leave that there. Um, currently, we have a number of fiscal sponsorships. Um, we have, I know some of them are on the call, um, and I wanted before I get into, actually before I get into introductions, I'm sorry, Meg, I just want to share one more thing. If you're interested in um, looking either as, you know, for your own fiscal sponsorship. Can you still see the screen? This is our website. Yeah. Um, if you go to our website, you go to about, click on opportunities. And all of the information about fiscal sponsorship and the way that we operate the program, what we, how we vet um, different projects, that's all available right here. And we have our inquiry process and our project funding cycle, how things work once you become a fiscal sponsor. It's all right there. We don't have the actual contract. We do get into that more once we start the a formal relationship. Um, but most of it's in here already. So if you are interested either in becoming a fiscal sponsor or um, approaching a nonprofit for fiscal sponsorship, you're welcome to use this. If you'd like us to be a fiscal sponsor, obviously that's why we're here. So, um, so I just wanted to share that. Let me go back. Thanks, Val. Real quick, I want, we have one of our um, fiscally sponsored projects uh, leaders on the call and that is Megan Young, who we work with on sign stealing. And I know she's time limited and I just wanted to call her out and see if she has any, I don't know, tips or thoughts sent going through the program. Uh, Megan, you're welcome to say hello. I see you, I don't see you, but I know you're there, I think. Where is she? There she is. Okay, can we hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hey, thanks for the shout out. Yeah, um, everything has been great. I was hoping that maybe at this point there was any questions um, maybe I could respond to from my experience, but I'll say that having worked with other fiscal sponsored agents, I really appreciate how upfront um, Assembly has been super clear in walking me through the process, um, consistent with communication, which is helpful um, really at every stage. Uh, setting up a fiscal sponsorship, but then in um, in continuing to manage granted funds and projects and making sure that everything is um, being done properly and accounted for. Um, and then honestly, it's really nice to be sort of one of a group of other um, projects that I'm super, sorry, beeping, <laughs> that I'm super proud to be, you know, in this group of other um, fiscally sponsored projects that Assembly is supporting as well. Like, I think that it's nice to be in um, excellent company of these groups that are doing amazing things in the area. Um, yeah, so I guess those are my hot takes. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, if there's any questions before Megan has to jump off for her directly about like her experience or what, you know, um, expenses or anything that you can think of, please just unmute yourself and shout it out. I guess, Megan, I'll ask you a quick question. What, um, in terms of tracking expenses and having 
done this myself and receipts, like how, how do you do that? Do you have a system for your receipt tracking or how do you, how do you manage that? So um, what I do is I have a, yeah, I use like a folder system. I use Google Docs um, and I have a folder for anything related to the fiscally sponsored project. Um, obviously many folders, but so receipts go in there. And then every month I do a spreadsheet that is actually provided by assembly. I use the template um, to list out what I have spent that a uh, month and then I match it up with my receipts, make sure that everything um, matches up with what assembly is expecting. Money is at the beginning of the month, at the end of the month. Um, and the nice thing about the template also is you sort of share um, the discrete use of those funds. And so that actually will help me at the end of the year also when I'm reporting on that both personally and back to assembly. So then I share that um, with uh, assembly and you know then we both have access to it. Um, it's a pretty smooth process. Thank you. That's super. I got to give Megan Young is really excellent. One of my favorite fiscal sponsorship <laughs> projects to work with. She's very, very organized and lovely. So <laughs> that's a good thing you brought up too about the monthly expenses. Um, we do have that as part of the assembly fiscal sponsorship program. So we ask for a monthly report of what you have spent. If you haven't spent anything, you can say zero, but that way we're just sort of keeping track along the way of the expenditures for your project rather than waiting until the project is over or at the end of the year, which can be really hairy. So um, yes, thanks for mentioning that. All right, anybody good? I don't see anything in the chat. We've got a bunch of other questions I saw pop through the chat, um, which we can reserve for a general q and I don't see, there was a couple other folks I was expecting to be here from our projects, but I don't see them. So since we've got 15 minutes left, I'm going to hop into the Q&A and say a big thank you to Megan um, for that info. And also a huge thank you to Valerie for that wonderful presentation. There was a lot of information in there and it was really well organized. So thank you. Um, so like I said, questions in the chat, but if anybody wants to raise their hand or just shout out a question. Oh, and... Megan, you, you noted that um, Neighborhood Connections grants do accept fiscal sponsorship. Yes. It's a little bit, their project is, con is constantly kind of like shifting. So we're in the process of connecting with them on how exactly they work with fiscal sponsors, but, um, but they do accept fiscal sponsorship. You mentioned that to me and I missed it in the chat because I had this open. Oh no, that's okay. We were presenting. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing someone, they're very quiet. I think, maybe not. I don't know. You said Julio de Burgos also sometimes accept fiscal sponsorship. Oh, Julio de Burgos also offers fiscal sponsorship. Okay, that's good to know. Hey, do they offer it or accept it through the grant they do from- Oh, they accepted one for me. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Got a move house also accepted one for me and um, Food Strong also did in Cleveland Foundation through Food Strong, yeah. Okay, very good. Your audio is super quiet on my end for some reason, my sis. So I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, all right, let's get to these couple of questions in the chat quickly because I know folks had had these up here. Um, there were a couple of things about wanting to become um, a 501c3 or uh, applying for a 501c3 and just some requirements. What are what are basic requirements for starting that process? Um, what can we? What kind of information can we provide to them, Valerie? If you want to, yeah. Well, there's a first thing. Five hundred one C three is a federal designation. So first thing is you gotta contact the federal government and work through the IRS. That in and of, in and of itself could be a multi month process. So that's for starters, and then you go from there. So get ready to do paperwork and get ready to wait if you're going to do a 501c3. So I would just start with that. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, it is a complex process. It is not something that you just hop into overnight for sure. It's, that's another thing that Volunteer Lawyers VR help, helps with often with, if you're interested in navigating the legal scope. Um, Ohio has, I believe, a if you have a very, very small budget, 
Um, I don't know how small, I don't know what the threshold is, but there's a shorter process you can go through to apply for a nonprofit status. And then as you grow, you have to go and um, get the bigger. Uh, this is Mark Krasny with Freedom Floor. Yeah. Um, so um, there's three options. Uh, with the federal government, there are two ways to do a 501c3. There's a simple process called the 1023EZ. Uh, if you're an entity with uh, less, with 50,000 or less in yearly income, it's a fairly simple process. The more complicated one is a full-blown 501c3 process. Um, and then the other option is within the state of Ohio, you can form a LLC nonprofit, uh, which does give you some advantages, but uh, really not the full advantages of a 501c3. And if you're interested in any help, uh, not only assembly, but also Cleveland score can help uh, mm -hmm. anyone interested in starting up. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, if anyone didn't hear, that is Mark Cross and Mark Cross is with SCORE, um, a division of the SBA Small Business Administration. And we've been talking with Mark for a couple of months now. So a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, there are a couple really, really good questions I want to get to in here. And Bellamy asked, can you define a charitable project? What does that mean exactly? Charitable, so a charitable project is a project that is, um, it goes to, to sort of, that it's not solely intended to make yourself a profit, honestly, is, is the easy answer. Um, but ultimately, if you're applying for a grant, you usually have to make the case for how that how those funds are going to impact um, residents, impact the community, impact the environment. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it's about um, it's not about prov like making enough money to provide your shareholders or to give back money to the foundation. It's really about that piece that you need, you're contributing to the project to advance the community in some way. Is that, is that sound right to everybody else who I know is an expert in these things? I don't want to be the only one to answer that question. <laughs> I think that sounds good. That's and that, the, the piece, what is it, Jeremy? Well, well, I would say it sounds good to me, uh, again, emphasizing that it's a charitable project is not uh, a for-profit where the goal is to make money per se, it is about a social good. Yeah. That's very general. And I'm sure uh, people like Mark Cross could add some more detail, but in general, uh, uh, that would be a general. And, I'm and Mike Russell just added a link into the govern for the IRS definition of charitable purpose also. Oh, great. With the caveat that it's a short definition that contains an entire universe. So <laughs> relatively few words, but it's quite large. Thank you for putting that in there. I'm going to look at it. Um, another great question from Natalie Lamise. Can you incubate a project with fiscal sponsorship that you intend to become a for-profit business? That, sure. that's, that, that's a confusing one. I mean, it's tough because ultimately, if, you're, if you want to become a for-profit business, the goal is to generate revenue either for yourself your own or your owners so if you aren't if you're a for-profit bit you can make money as a nonprofit. basically is what i'm saying you can be a charitable cause you just can't that money just has to go back into the nonprofit. you can also earn a salary but you can't take the money off the top that you earn that cut that comes in above and beyond what you know that's that's the major difference there um, if you're creating a for-profit business and that pro that that for-profit business, a grant that you get would have to go into the project itself. If the project is um, generally for the purposes of bettering people's lives, um, and you're not asking, a lot of foundations will ask. You know, if you're earning, if you're if you're charging for a fee, these aren't. These, it's basically, you can't use it as an investment fund. You have to find investors if you're trying to create like angel investor fund. It's, it's a way to, to access grant funds and the grantors are typically the people who are going to determine if your project meets their funding criteria. Mm -hmm. 
It's a weird response to a complicated question, but I, <laughs> kind of, yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand with that charitable project definition yeah. of the greater good and how do we define that and, um, you know, what makes a nonprofit. I think there's a misconception sometimes that people think as a nonprofit, you can't pay yourself or you don't make money, which is 100%. Yeah, I don't, that's not so much my question is that like, I don't want to run a nonprofit. I'm already an artist um, with a full-time job. So this would be like an expansion to what my practice is. Um, it would be educational in purpose, in its purpose and mission. Um, so I guess maybe another way of stating the question is like, once I've used the grant money, is there anything saying like what I do next? No. <laughs> okay. No. I mean, it's just a matter okay. of how you use the, how you use the funds. And then sure. if you wanted to start the business, there's always, um, in any, in any agreement, any good agreement, you have an exit clause. So if you're, if you mm -hmm. want to end the ties or your project has been completed, um, it's not, it's not an uncommon, nor should it be an uncommon clause to have in a contract. And it's, and it's a good thing, actually, you don't want to be a fiscal sponsorship typically forever. It's usually right. something that's time, time delimited. So you're not roping yourself into nonprofit world forever. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Yep. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mark great, just put a great link in the um, chat about is a, is a nonprofit right for you um, coming from Candid. So that might be real helpful um, material to take a look at. Let's see um, here. Question to Valerie on that topic she was talking about. Go oh, ahead. This, go ahead. Um, what if I if I get to open a nonprofit, and some of the projects that I put out has me as a, one of the artists that are being working on some presentations or shows? Because most of my projects, I am there in the front doing things. How would that work? Uh, would that this just get paid as an employee of the nonprofit or also would get paid as an artist? Uh, how would that work in case I get to start a nonprofit? Yeah, ultimately you, uh, nonprofits all have um, employees. I shouldn't say all. There are lots of nonprofits that are run by volunteers. Um, but yes, you could be for the administrative work, a full-time employee. Um, you could also be, if you, don't want to be listed as a full-time employee, you would get contract work, but you do have to sort of define how that time is spent. Um, part of a, an audit, every nonprofit has to do an audit and you have to say how much time was spent towards the mission deliver, mission project based on what you've spent in salaries. Um, so you would probably, when it comes to that, you probably wanna, I think VLA would probably be a really good resource for that or Candid or any of these resources that um, our, our esteemed colleagues here are sharing. But um, essentially, yes, you can pay yourself. How you pay yourself could be a variety of different ways based on what's best for you. Um, either way, there are, there are paperwork that you have to file and all that. I'd like to chime in on this. That's a Please do, question. yes. There's a reason why we didn't call this how to create a nonprofit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are a thousand one questions about nonprofits, but there are some pros to becoming a fiscal sponsor, whereas one of the previous uh, commenters said, you don't have to do that annual audit. You don't have to hire necessarily the marketing person, the development person, um, the, the office. When you create a nonprofit, you add on a whole bunch of expenses before you actually do your work, before you actually start teaching, before you actually start doing your art. Being a nonprofit requires you to put a lot of money out there just to get that structure. So the fiscal sponsorship allows you to continue to do your work, whatever you're good at. And it also allows you to possibly connect with people who may want to fund you. And let me answer, Ephraim had a question also, um, how can a fiscal sponsorship help with money, really you should think of it as a tool. You may already have connections to a foundation or a funder, you see that, uh, but you don't have that 501, you don't have a fiscal sponsorship. So it's a tool, but there's not automatically money as part of being a fiscal sponsor. Valerie mentioned this early. So let us be very clear. 
this if you were a fiscal sponsee uh, as you would be under our fiscal sponsorship or under anyone else's there, there's not automatically money there you already have you still have to go for folks but the folks who give the money the reason why you're a fiscal sponsee is because they tend to only give money to fiscally sponsored projects or the 501c3s and you're not going to get the money from a foundation unless you are fiscally sponsored or unless you're a 501c3. So uh, think of it as a tool to access particular funders who only give to certain uh, certain types of entities. Um, can, I piggy, can I piggyback on that, uh, yes. what, what you're saying? Mm -hmm. I think fiscal sponsors, especially what you all are offering is very beautiful. Um, the work of being a nonprofit is a lot of work. I mean, I know the benefits that uh, a lot of people are seeing that some of the nonprofits may have garnered from their work. It's not easy getting there, and I'm not trying to discourage no one, but to have someone who can fiscally, uh, especially artists or businesses who, who just need that kind of support. From what I understand, I understand you all saying you only take 6%, but the administrative management part that comes that helps you stay on task and keep the professional side of it moving while you're doing the art or the talent of your project, that's that's golden. You know, even as a, um, I'm, I'm chair for a, 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 a nonprofit, but me sitting on this, I'm also looking at the relationship of as an artist or an individual, I wouldn't use my own nonprofit per se to do the um, a grant. I would probably come through assembly because assembly is like a relationship that I would want for the art that I'm doing. And I would want that administrative to where I can learn from where I know they have a skill set even though I have a skill set, it would just be beautiful to use your fiscal sponsor for the talent that I have, where I can just do my art and know that I am achieving the work that we've agreed to do and have someone who can partner with me in the community. It's just a beautiful relationship. Thanks for that, Ethan. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, it also allows us to work with a lot of groups that they haven't created the nonprofit entity yet, but they are community based, they're grassroots, they're black led, women led, LP, really disenfranchised groups, which often don't have an opportunity to apply to foundations, to state entities, to government entities. And we can serve as that boost for that. And this is really why we do this work at Assembly. It's part of our mission to be able to serve community. There's a lot of red tape you have to go through if you're going to apply, whether it's to Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, to the State Arts Council, to the National Endowment. But if you do it as through a fiscal sponsor, it cuts down on, on quite a bit of it. Not all of it, but quite a bit of, of that heavy lift. I want to just add to Juliana's. Uh, Juliana asked a question. If you're already a C3, is there any benefit to pursuing fiscal sponsorship? And it's true. Uh, Typically, foundations are it's it's a it's a paperwork that you need to have, but it would really be dependent on the funder. Some funders, if they don't know you, would feel more comfortable funding an organization with a longer track record, or um, if they if they feel they know that those funds are being handled through a fiscal sponsor. So there is there isn't a reason for doing it if that if that funder really feels like th that you need that extra um, vote of confidence or, or extra many management support or, or however you want to say it. I don't know if my words are coming out right, but that's that's only that and that's really the only only reason that I can think of. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Valerie. Um, okay, so we're a couple minutes over our hour um, for this workbench session. Thank you for all the great questions. We do have a ton of information available as, as Valerie mentioned on the website about fiscal sponsorship. We're happy to talk with folks individually about the program offered through assembly um, and any specifics. So we will be following up with an email with the recording of this session and some links to resources and various um, links to the upcoming workbench sessions. 
Uh, what else? We also have a new segment email coming out, uh, the Workbox email, which is sort of an extension of this program. And it's just an email dedicated to resources um, that you need help sharing or um, you want to look at. So uh, if you have stuff you wanna share, send it over to us. It is more about resources, opportunities, access to networks than it is about events. So keep an eye out for those. You can sign up for it on our homepage. So thank you everyone for participating. We appreciate you and we could not do this work without you. So we will see you next time.